Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, coverage from the annual Sea Earth Space Conference in Washington, D.C. We're here at the event to bring you the biggest headlines. And what's more dangerous than Marines with artillery? Marines with more accurate artillery. Check out a new piece of tech called the Next Generation Handheld Targeting System. Plus, is it finally the end for the A-10? Two military budget experts break down the latest on the White House's defense spending plan. And two top leaders head for the Hill. The Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and Secretary of Defense appear before Congress to answer questions. With the latest in news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, this is Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. First up this week is our coverage from the Navy League's annual Sea Air Space Conference in Washington, D.C. It's an annual exposition of some of the latest systems and ideas the force is looking at. And we're on the ground to bring you some of the highlights. Let's check it out. Megan, here we are at the Sea Air Space Conference from the Navy League. And the theme this year is Campaign Forward. What do they mean by that? The National Defense Strategy has been released in its classified form, but its upcoming release uh, in an unclassified form. And really what's being uh, previewed here at Sea Air Space this year is the notion of campaigning forward, which is a maritime strategy where, you know, we don't just have ships and aircraft and personnel out and about for no reason. They're really focused on being at the exact right place at the exact right time to provide the best deterrent against China. Um, so the idea of campaigning forward is really sort of synchronizing all the forward presence to make sure that the forces that are available are used, are used as smartly as possible. And China is a big country that has ocean, but it, it's a lot of it is landlocked. Are there areas that are the best areas that they're that they're kind of focusing on right now, or is that kind of up in the air? It's really the South China Sea. Um, obviously, like you said, China is a large country, but where the military assesses they pose the greatest geopolitical threat is really sort of their behavior towards their neighbors in the South China Sea. So the idea behind campaigning forward and other deterrent strategies is to say uh, the Navy should be in China's way. If they want to be aggressive with their neighbors, the Navy should already be there and be watching them and prevent it from happening if possible, and if not, be there to monitor, record, and really expose to the world what's happening in those contested areas. And in terms of technology and systems being developed, one story you had was on laser weapons, on directed energy, and Northrop Grumman was asking something kind of interesting that maybe instead of them making the entire systems for the Navy is they kind of want to outsource parts of it. Tell us about that. Yeah, so there's a new acquisition strategy that they're uh, working with the Defense Department to kind of propose. Um, and the idea is that under this acquisition strategy, you would have one kind of prime contractor, but you would have subsystems. Uh, so one company might work on the battery system, one company might work on cooling, one might work on you know the interface between the laser itself and the combat system on the ship. And the idea is to really create expertise uh, within industry, but also to create more suppliers that have familiarity with laser weapon systems. Uh, right now, the companies are really only kind of building these in a one-off fashion, since it largely remains a research and development project. But once the services get into acquisition, they're going to have to be produced in much larger numbers, and industry just can't do that right now. So this approach would bring many more companies into that supply chain. And what other kinds of technologies are we looking at? I've heard a lot about autonomous ships. The idea, for the Navy at least, is that autonomy shouldn't be a thing in and of itself. It should be a tool to enable other um, you know, missions to take place. So the Navy is really looking at AI, uh, machine learning, unmanned systems as a tool to supplement you know, manned ships, manned submarines, manned aircraft. But how can they take systems um, and maybe find the best targets, maybe you know, find the smartest way to do maintenance, um, kind of identify needs before they occur, uh, take away some you know, dull, dirty, dangerous missions away from manned craft and offload them onto unmanned. 
So the Navy is really viewing these as tools to help them achieve their, their ends that they have rather than something to be kind of looked at in a bubble. And you mentioned AI, artificial intelligence. It's a lot of different companies working on it, a lot of computer companies, and a, and a lot of people are trying to get on it right now. What's kind of the next step for that that the Navy wants to see? Um, I think they're really just looking, you know, there's kind of a joke about, you know, AI being a buzzword, sprinkle a little bit of it here, yeah. sprinkle a little bit there. Um, they really want to sort of have a strategy that looks at how AI is being implemented. Uh, the Navy actually has an unmanned task force uh, that was set up at the Pentagon, and that's one of the issues that they're looking at, is how, you know, in a smarter, kind of holistic way, they can look at technologies and enablers such as artificial intelligence and figure out how to apply them, how to acquire them, how to bring in industry, and really um, a pre-planned kind of smart approach. The Navy is a growing service and it's really advancing. One interesting story you had was that they're decommissioning some of the ships. What's going on there? The Navy is actually on a path to decrease by about 18 ships over the next five years, uh, which sounds counterintuitive when you think of all the threats around the world, particularly China as a pacing threat, and their Navy is growing so quickly. However, the point the Navy is trying to make in their uh, FY23 budget proposal is that the Navy doesn't need to be larger, it needs to be more ready, and it needs to be more lethal. So what we're seeing here at Sea Air Space is a lot of proposals for how to make the Navy more lethal, uh, whether it's looking at you know, future weapon systems, whether it's looking at enablers to help sailors do their jobs better, uh, but really just focusing on having a better fleet rather than a larger fleet. Well, Megan, you're a super busy person. Thank you for carving out some time for us. Thank you. Doug, we are beneath a scale model of the Triton, which is currently deployed with the U.S. Navy. It's an autonomous vehicle. Can you tell me a little bit about it, please? Yes, uh, uh, Triton now uh, for the U.S. Navy, you know, it's a high altitude, long endurance platform. It can fly 24 hours a day. That's altitudes greater than 50,000 feet. And what that does, the value proposition there is, it can see a large range, see a lot of targets on the ocean, and truly understand the intent of what every vessel is doing on the ocean. So autonomy is really the only kind of technology you can employ uh, on this kind of system. And th that's the, the big highlight of this one, that it essentially flies itself and sends information to a ground station, if I'm, if I'm getting that right. Yes. What makes it so that it can last a lot longer than a, a manned aircraft with people inside of it? Well, the idea there's no uh, personnel in the air vehicle, right? So it actually takes uh, three cruise shifts to manage one flight of a Triton. But what keeps it out of altitude, you can see the wingspan, large as a 737 wingspan, uh, that provides uh, more like of a glider type uh, uh, airfoil. Uh, and with the engine at high altitudes, it can stay up for hours of 24 hours at a time. So all that information, it is flown autonomously. Uh, all the information and data transmits over satellite to a ground segment where there's operators, you know, under, analyzing the data and disseminating that across to all the warfighters to truly give uh, maritime domain awareness to the operators. And I imagine the suite of sensors it has is probably different for every plane or, or what, what they order? Well, well, for the U.S. Navy, we have electro-optical infrared sensors for imagery. We have an MFAS radar to detect the vessels on the on the ocean. We also have AIS to give, uh, you know, understand what those vessels are. So, uh, and we also have SIGINT payloads on here too. So the combination of all those sensors with all that information coming to a ground station fused together can provide total situational awareness to the operator. And this aircraft flies itself. How does it know where to go? It flies itself. So there are predetermined mission plans, but uh, during a mission an operator can give it new waypoints and it can um, it can route itself in uh, different directions. And the technology is not only in the Triton, it's also in a more familiar aircraft, I believe a helicopter? We also have a, a, an unmanned autonomous uh, helicopter built off the Bo uh, Bell uh, 407 aircraft and that's currently deployed off of the littoral combat ships. This is a very advanced aircraft, but I can't imagine that it stopped right there. What's the next step in advancing the technology of this? Right, the configuration is currently deployed as I said, it'll collect a lot of data. So now we need tactical decision aids to go help the operators on the ground to really sift through that data and through machine learning also understand patterns of life to really provide the best value to the warfighters so they can make their jobs more efficient as we go forward. So they're the technologies we're looking at as we move forward. Well, Doug, thanks, thanks for having us over. All right, thank you. When we come back, an advanced new targeting system directing artillery gets into the hands of Marines. Find out how it works.
The military and defense market is constantly evolving. Stay on top of the latest news with Sightline Media Group's live events. Continue to learn, understand new tools and technologies. We're live, you're on in three. Defense, two, government, one. and industry leaders come together for successful and proven engaging events. You'll gain valuable insight. Get the chance to ask questions, all from the comfort of your own home or office. Sign up for our events newsletters and receive alerts for upcoming live streams. Welcome back. What's more dangerous than Marines with artillery? Marines with more accurate artillery. Check out a new piece of tech called the Next Generation Handheld Targeting System. So pretty much ever since there's been indirect fire, such as artillery, even cannons, or even later on with airplanes and close air support, there's always been an issue with targeting. How does a soldier, a sailor, a marine, someone on the ground close to the combat gets, get munitions targeting from any kind of platform to where they need to get something destroyed? One of the newest solutions to that targeting problem for the marine on the ground is the next generation handheld targeting system. This system is basically a way for Marines to get any munition from pretty much any platform to a target on the battlefield when they need it and where they need it, even if GPS is denied or degraded. So in February, the Marine Corps awarded Northrop Grumman a $252 million contract to create such a device. They can expect it to deliver that device under 10 pounds in about a year. So this new device is going to provide really three areas that the Marine Corps is going after. That's to increase situational awareness, basically knowing what's going on, um, have accurate coordination of fires, so if you have to have multiple platforms firing at different times or in sync, and also getting beyond line of sight. It has to go over the horizon or to an area where I might not be able to see, but I know there's something I need to hit. So this device is going to really bring in things from artillery, aircraft, loitering munitions, loitering drones, missile strikes or missile systems that are way away from the battlefield, have a far distance to reach the battlefield, and even ships onshore firing naval gunfire, other types of coordinated precision guidance systems. So in winning the contract, Northrop Grumman has really promised to provide rapid target acquisition, laser terminal guidance operation, later spot imaging, which basically means illuminating a surface with a laser, high definition infrared sensors with accuracy and grid capability over extended ranges, and high definition color display with day and night celestial compass. Celestial meaning stars, so basically you can navigate by the stars through the device if you can't get GPS. Now this isn't the first time that the Marines have had such a system. It hasn't always been maps and compasses and pencils and papers. I mean, that was the way it was done decades ago, but we've had high tech for a while. However, this device will replace four existing devices. The portable lightweight designated rangefinder, the joint terminal attack controller, the laser target designator, and the thermal laser spot imager. All those are coming out of Marine Corps Systems Command. So rather than maintaining, supplying, and delivering four different systems that are tailored to specific types of firing and targeting, one system will do it all. Not to be outdone, the Army has their own system that went through testing and evaluation in 2018 and 19 and began fielding in 2020. That system is known as the Joint Effects Targeting System, or JETS. Now JETS comes in a little bit under 17 pounds and has three major modules, so it's a little bit more to carry. It has a handheld target location module, a laser marking module, a precision azimuth vertical angle module, and a tripod mount for those different systems. While the Army has begun fielding its own jet systems a couple years ago, the Marines are starting to field that new prototype from Northrop Grumman next year, expecting to be fully fielded and fully completed across the Marine Corps by 2030. For Military Times, this is Todd Stow. Next up, with the future of the military coming into focus through the annual budget process, top Pentagon leaders headed to Capitol Hill to face questions from Congress. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Mark Milley and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin appeared before lawmakers to defend the 2020 plans. Here are some of the highlights. Uh, we had General Walters, uh, UCOM commander, testify before us and, and uh, he stated that it was his uh, best military judgment that we should reallocate some of our European troops um, for permanent basing in Poland, Romania and in the Baltics. And your best military judgment, uh, is that a good deterrent uh, for us to uh, pursue? My advice would be uh, to create permanent bases, but don't permanently station. So you get the effect of permanence by rotational forces cycling through permanent bases. Uh, and, and, and what you don't have to do is incur the cost of family moves, uh, PXs, schools, housing, and that sort of thing. 
So you cycle through expeditionary forces through forward deployed permanent bases. And I believe that a lot of our European allies, especially those uh, such as in the Baltics or Poland or Romania or elsewhere, uh, they are very, very willing to establish permanent bases. Uh, they'll build them, they'll pay for them, et cetera. And for us to cycle through on a rotational basis, so you get the effect of permanent presence of forces, but the actual individual soldier, sailor, airman, marine are not permanently stationed there for two or three years. What in the $773 billion that you're requesting today is going to help you make assessments that are accurate in the face of so many blown calls? You, you've, you've seen what's in our budget. You've seen how the budget matches the strategy. And so I'll let that speak for itself. Well, I mean, I've also seen that we're behind, Mr. Secretary. We're behind in hypersonics. We failed to deter Russia. Last year, China so what do you, what do you, what do you mean we're behind in hypersonics? How, how do you... Okay, how do you, who do you, who's ahead in hypersonics? How, how, do you, how, do you, how do you... How do you make that assessment? I don't know. How, is, may, is I make that assessment one? because is China is yielding hypersonic weapon hypersonics? systems and we are still developing them. I are make that assessment because Russia actually used one. Development of By the way, your own people brief us that we are behind and that China is winning. Are you aware of the briefings we get on hypersonics? I am certainly aware of briefings that we provide to, to Congress. But it, it's not just the hypersonics. When we come back, is it time to get into the housing market? Our personal finance expert reads the real estate tea leaves. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack talks about whether it's a good time to enter the housing market. Whether you're buying or selling a home, it's a huge financial decision. Add that pressure to the current housing market and you get a few more hurdles to overcome in your mission to be a homeowner. An up and down market takes added attention and quick action, but you can do it. If you've got a home to sell, you need to get your house in order, literally. You'll need to quickly make minor repairs and cosmetic fixes to be ship shape to sell and get what you're asking for, maybe even more. With the market as unpredictable as it is, finding an expert real estate agent is key. Someone who'll help you understand just what and how much you can expect to get in today's housing market. Next, shore up your finances so you'll know exactly what you can afford. Work with a loan officer you trust. They'll work out how much house you can safely afford to finance and walk you through the buying process. In a changing market, the part of the process you might find the most difficult is practicing patience. Buying or selling a house is worth all the waiting. It truly does pay off when you're selling, and when buying, it can help ease the stress of back and forth bidding. The bottom line things to do are to get pre-qualified, lock in your rate ASAP, make your offer, and eventually you will get the home you want. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next time. To get more of our coverage, be sure to check out our headlines online at Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com and DefenseNews.com. And for a list of our top stories in your email each weekday, subscribe to the Early Bird Brief. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And when we come back, is it the end of the A-10? Top military budget experts explore the future of America's armed forces. Welcome back. Recently, the White House released its 2023 budget request, a whopping $773 billion budget that included some surprising twists. On the chopping block, the Air Force's beloved but aging A-10. Is it the end of the warthog? Two experts stopped by our studio recently to talk about the budget request. Here's part of their conversation with senior Pentagon reporter Joe Goulds. So this budget, like the last budget, emphasized China and Russia, and this request, as you uh, touched on, Mackenzie, um, boasts the Pentagon's largest R&D uh, budget yet at about $130 billion uh, for new weapons like hypersonic missiles. Um, but it would retire some other systems like the LCS, the littoral combat ship, um, also the A-10, uh, popular aircraft on the hill. Um, which defense uh, officials have been arguing isn't um, relevant to a high high end fight. Um, so there's so there's some continuity here with this uh, the administration wanting to divest from legacy, uh, what it calls legacy platforms to reinvest elsewhere. Um, do you guys can you guys uh, talk about some of the divestments that we're going to see and you know or, or some of the divestments that are getting proposed and and what kind of pushback we're seeing already or should expect to see. Um, and, and maybe even what, what's likely to actually go through. Will the administration be successful? Sure. 
So I, I think we're getting to one of the big questions aside from inflation that Congress is going to have to come to terms with because the department has settled, it seems, on their answer. And that's, do you believe the Admiral Davidson window, right? That the, chan that the possibility for Beijing to decide taking action against Taiwan is a, is a six-year, now a five-year window problem, a hearing now problem. I think Congress is very sympathetic to that view. This budget is not. And so the, that's where the two branches of government are diverging. And so that's how they can justify a lot of these divestitures. It is so much more than even the ones you've outlined, Joe. The Army, the Navy, and the Air Force all get smaller, older, and less ready in this budget. And you can take that risk if you believe that the challenges are, are further out into the future. Um, department leadership in, in the budget briefings talk about, you know, how they took like a, a three fit up look at the mm -hmm. problem. That's a 15 year window where they were trying to sort of shape this budget to think about, you know, when they're not even going to have these jobs, the people who were making those decisions. So on one hand, that's kind of a laudable thing to do. On the other hand, um, I think Congress is looking around the world saying things are really bad now. Mm -hmm. So why risk capacity? Let's go. We can, I'll just briefly touch upon, I mean, because it's, it's all kinds of aircraft for the Air Force. It's, it's like 150 is the number that's higher, higher than 150. It's higher than that. We're, I'm trying to pin it down myself mm -hmm. as well, but I believe it's somewhere between 240 and 260 right. aircraft, wow. not just fighters, right? So it's, it's all This cargo. is where having the detailed J books matters. Right, exactly. Um, for the Army, it's rotary wing capability and Army vehicles, not every vehicle. Like there are some winners like the JLTV but the rest are not. And then for the Navy, um, you know, it's all kinds, it's not only the ships that are gonna retire, which is, you know, two times greater than the new build, two, two and a half times actually. It's 24. To eight. Something something like that, there's 24. Yeah. 24 Navy, retiring Navy ships vessels. to eight, eight new construction. Right. It's not nine, as Senator Reinhoff tweeted about, <laughs> which Congress said, you're not allowed to do that in previous defense yeah. bills. I'm glad Senator Reinhoff reminded everyone. They, do? they double dip, they kind of took credit for mm -hmm. the one that was already. It's yeah. already been authorized yeah. and approved, right? So it's eight new construction ships, but then, and the, and the ships they're proposing to retire have so much service. I mean, one of the LCS is, has, the hole's been in the water for two years. Uh, the, amphib the amphibious capability, um, combined, they have 25 years of service life left in them. Congress is not going to take this well. But then you look at the programs that are canceled or truncated or slowed. There's a lot of those and they're only trickling out because of this like, yeah. you know, uh, budget data that's only also trickling out. But um, I can I can give you a couple of different examples like the LPD mm -hmm. Amphib. Right. So that program is was supposed to be built of record to 42. This is the last year the Pentagon were proposed building it at just 32. Mm. So that's that's ending the program 10 ships early, for example. Yeah. In sorry, go ahead. Tom. Yeah, no, so I would say this is one where McKinsey and I often can finish each other's sentences and agree <laughs> on a lot of things. This is one where I think I, I disagree a bit. That I think that it is smart to make a lot of these divestments. Um you know, and and I, I take your point about the timeline of the threat, you know, especially with China, China potentially thinking it can take a move on, on Taiwan at 2025, 26 or 27. That's that's what people are, are saying in the intel community. Um, you know, with that point taken, I look at some of the divestments and I don't think they would play in that scenario anyway. Mm. You're not going to use an A-10 in that scenario. It's not going to get anywhere near the fight. Um, LCS, not going to get near the fight. Uh, I think that some of these platforms are things that are just wasting assets. Um, they, they, they're great, great platforms. Don't get me wrong. Well, I can't even say that about the LCS. That was an acquisition mistake. Um, right. But like the A10, great platform. It's just we don't need it anymore. Mm. We've got other ways of doing close air support. And you know what? Close air support is not a high priority mission in this strategy. If we're realistic with ourselves, it's not about putting large numbers of boots on the ground, moving in large formations, taking over territory, you know, pushing out an enemy. That that's not what you do in a China in a, in a fight with China. That's not the primary mission. So I, I think we we do need to look at divesting some of these platforms. And honestly, I would say that even if the budget environment was completely different, even if we had an $850 billion budget, I would say still you need to divest the A-10. Um, and we ought to be investing that money elsewhere. Uh, and LCS, I mean, you know, you gotta, at some point you got to stop throwing good money after bad money.
And that's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.